Where are the low value men? Like, what are what are all the low value men up to during these trying times? Because the high value men, they, I know they're around. They won't shut the fuck up. Low value men, I have not heard a word out of. I'm starting to think I'm on their side. I think I want one of those. I want a low value man. They don't make podcasts. I haven't seen one low value man make a podcast. Do they not know how to use microphones? Maybe that's a good thing. That's that's hot. All right, I haven't seen, I've never seen a man use a microphone for good. Until now, everybody buckle up. It's low value mail time with your host, Danny Polishchuk. What's happening, everybody? Welcome back to an all new episode of low value mail. It's episode 63. Is that significant? Not the number. Although I'm trying to get this numerologist uh, Gamatria guy on the show, so maybe it is. I don't know. Maybe he'll explain it to us. But that is not important. What is important on this May 23rd, uh, 2023? Look at all these numbers that are popping up. We have an amazing guest for you tonight. Uh, Roy Price is going to be joining us very shortly on the show. If you don't know who Roy Price is, Roy Price founded Amazon video he's the former head of amazon studios he's won 14 best series awards at the emmys and golden globes uh he has some amazing insight on the film and tv industry as well as some cool thoughts on how crypto nfts will be a part of the movie industry going forward and if you know me you know that uh i am i don't i'm not an aspiring uh writer i mean i've written uh and and i started a movie called phil city you can check it out it's on tubi when i was back in canada ryan long and myself uh we wrote uh, a movie that uh is in i don't know what's going on with that but anyways uh I'm, i'm very excited about this because as someone who is a lifelong tv and movie fan it's just it'll be nice to speak with somebody who like really knows what's going on but more importantly where things are headed because i think a lot of people are pretty frust. definitely people who are watching this are pretty frustrated uh with the state of a lot of this stuff so we're going to be joined by roy very shortly uh, in the meantime, just a little housekeeping to get out of the way, as always. And thank you very much. I just want to say, everybody, for taking their their uh, Tuesday nights to come, to come hang with uh, myself over on Low Value Mail. We do appreciate you. But so, as always, if you want to support the show, you can do so. Just like, subscribe, leave a rating, review if you're listening to this. Um, and then, as always, we're going to have an after show at 11 p.m. The after show is super chill. We just get copyright claims watching videos uh, i think we got two last week uh so we we have a good time and if you want to get access to that you can sign up over on uh well here on youtube if you want to do that you can just become a scrot member over on youtube you can go sign up on patreon locals uh or even twitter you can do uh we can do it on twitter and then as always tomorrow and uh, just a note back to the subscriber thing, but once we hit 500 subscribers, which we're in the three ballpark, once we hit 500 subscribers, we'll be having some more content coming, whether that's, uh, I haven't decided yet. Either I'm going to make this show longer, go real coast to coast vibes, or we'll have a, like an afternoon show for all the Euro Australian people who stay up late to listen to this shit. Um, tomorrow night, we're back with an all new episode of The Bathhouse, live from the Stand Comedy Club Green Room at 10.30 p.m. And we are going to be joined tomorrow by show favorites, J.J. Lieberman, Derek Drescher, and my boy Steve Francois. All very funny comedians. Uh, Join my mailing list if you want to see me doing uh, stand-up where you live. Like, not in your house or anything, but I mean... No, I don't want to go to your house. I used to do gigs like that when I used to live in Canada where people would straight up be like, hey, can you just come do stand-up like for Christmas? And you'd be like, we're just, like everybody's like in their socks just drinking like eggnog and you're just doing stand-up for them with no microphone. It was, uh, comedians refer to these things as hell gigs. Hell gigs is what they are referred to as in the comedy, comedy industry. Um, So anyways, please do that. And uh, yeah, and then the phone lines, we will be opening the phone lines uh, at some point during the show. So without further ado, let me figure this out. We are going to bring 
Roy on one second, please, everybody. Hold on, Roy. Sorry, everybody. As you know, I do this all myself. Um, one second. One second, Roy. Here we go. Move that there. Do that there. Here we go, Roy. How you doing? <laughs> Sorry, Good, I had to. Danny. Yeah, I just had to rejigger a few things around in my uh, my streaming software over here. But thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate this. I'm super excited about this as I was uh, telling you off the air. And uh, we have we have uh, much to talk about, and uh, I'm pretty pumped. So, so Roy Price, thank you for coming on the show. How, how are you doing, Roy? Good. I appreciate it, and I'm very impressed by your mastery of of the uh, of Zoom. I'm. I mean, it's it's everything. I don't know if you know about this thing called like OBS, but I have this whole broadcasting software as well. So I'm like, I'm essentially running a TV show by myself right now. It's not a great TV show production wise, but it's not bad. <laughs> It's not. Right? I love it. Yeah, it's not bad either. It's not bad either. So, um, Roy, I think we. I don't know how how we connect. We connected somewhere on Twitter. We met when you were in New York, uh, maybe sometime last summer. I want to say yeah. very very mm -hmm. briefly. I remember you were wearing that sharp Mickey Mantle jersey. I That's do remember right. That. Yeah. Are you a Yankees yeah. fan? Uh, yes. And I went to the Yankees game that day, and then I I came by and saw you guys. Right. Right. Okay. Cool. Cool. So you have been uh working in the uh tv film industry for since what year uh the early 2000s is that correct uh probably the late 90s late 90s okay yeah. late so 90s I was, I was at disney then so you used to work at disney and then you moved over to amazon you basically founded if, if correctly uh like amazon studios is, is that the yeah yeah, so they Amazon wanted to get into digital video. They sold DVDs and stuff, and um, and so I went up to do that. You went up from you went to Seattle. Uh huh. You moved to Seattle. Yeah, I'd, that. I'd never been to Seattle. Really? You just and did they like did they find you or like how did how did that work? Uh, they had like a um an ad. Uh, I think at the McKinsey website. Yeah. And so I uploaded my resume because I had the idea to do basically the same thing, but on my own. And then uh, when I learned that they wanted to do it, I thought, well, they probably have a good, a good shot. They have a slight advantage. Yeah. Over so, me solo. Yeah. And this was 2000, what, four? Uh, I went up there in 2004. 2004. So in 2004, you were already like, because I'm trying to think, in 2004, I was living in Canada. I was still for sure doing like the, getting the Netflix, like where they send you the one DVD and then. Yeah. Which Netflix still does that? Is that true? I, do, I, I think they stopped that now. Or they stopped that pretty recently. But there was like yeah. up until fairly recently, there was still a small portion of that business that was like still remaining where they would correct straight up send you a DVD. There's still red box around, which I always, you know what I'm talking about? Like the, I think so. Yeah. yeah. It's like a vending machine. It's like a vending machine for DVDs. Do you have a way to play a DVD? I do not. Yeah. Neither do I. I always wondered like, and it's not even like everything's so cheap now. Like, technology wise where like i imagine if you wanted to buy a dvd player it's probably ten dollars yeah it's probably easy and you can also do it in your xbox but yeah, i don't yeah. have an xbox right now so uh i have dvds but no player oh, okay yeah I'm, I'm not much of a, a gamer myself so anyway so you, you started amazon studios uh or amazon video and amazon studios different thing <laughs> Well, Amazon Video is the service that you visit and right. they play videos. And Amazon Studios is the entity that produces the original content in the service. Right. I like, you know, uh, The Boys or, or whatever. And uh, so I went up there. Um, and the reason I left Disney to begin with was that I felt the Internet was going to totally change everything about television. And... Um, Disney was not going to ask the uh, TV animation execs to like figure that all out. So, uh, so that's why I left originally. And then 
uh, wound up at Amazon when they wanted to do that. And I was a huge Amazon fan. So I thought they had a great opportunity. And um, so, you know, got up there and I thought maybe they would have, you know, having been at McKinsey, I, I thought maybe they would have a big deck that was like, you know, this is how we figured this out and this is our strategy. And um, and so I, I asked my boss at the time, like whether that existed. And he just showed me an email from, I think an email from Jeff Bezos, Bezos uh, yeah. saying, you know, I think we should probably get into digital video. <laughs> and that that's, was like the whole. That's, that's it. He that just goes, it. And, and then that's, they just are like, we're just going to figure. And was there like a lot of pushback at the time? Like, were there a lot of people who were like, this is stupid. This is not the future kind of thing. Oh, yeah. You know, one of the one of the early gatherings uh, at Amazon that I went to, I, I met the guy who was running DVD. And I said, oh, yeah, I just started and I'm here to do digital video. And he said, oh, downloading video. Like, who is ever going to do that? <laughs> uh, you know, I had I'll was, never. Yeah, I'll never forget. I have a friend who tells a story where like when he was he's my age, uh, late 30s. And when the Internet was starting to become like, you know, ubiquitous kind of thing where everybody was like, but people were getting the Internet for the first time. And his mom like really put up a stink about getting the internet because she's like, this is just a fad. Like this thing is going to come and go. Why do we have to go like have someone come in our house and all this stuff? So, but you'd think this was his mom. She didn't work in tech, big tech. I mean, I don't know if it was Amazon considered big tech at that time. I think so. Yeah, probably. Right. At, at least medium tech, medium tech for sure. Yeah. So anyway, so you got that all off the ground. And so what, what are the, you know, the, the shows that I'm sure many of the people who are listening, watching know that you were kind of responsible for. Uh, so, you know, I, after a while I made the argument that we were going to have to get into original content and that everybody was going to get into original content to make their, service distinctive and a lot of people did not believe that that was uh controversial but uh we did start amazon studios get into original content and um in the early days we just did half hours so we did like transparent mozart in the jungle and uh then it went on to like fleabag and catastrophe marvelous mrs Maisel. And we started doing hours like The Boys and Bosch and, and other shows. And uh, um, and we did a lot of kids animation as well and movies. Yeah. And you kind of, I guess, what, saw that? Because it, it was a big part of having to make the content yourself that it was going to become difficult to license because everybody was going to be trying to license like the same like con finite amount of content. Like, is that part of well, it? Yeah, I think the two parts of it are you want your own distinctive content and your own distinctive brand that, you know, where you own the content, you control it. And secondly, some concern that at some point the studios might uh, pull back on licensing to third party uh, SVOD services, which indeed has happened. So, you know, the original content strategy was was critical. And we also launched original content uh, in uh, you know, overseas. So in India, Japan, Germany. So he spun up those programs and got some successful uh, shows in those areas. Cool, cool. Um, and uh, there was a cool, you, you had a tweet that I thought was really cool um, about the the Marvel and the Hulk thing that I thought pe people oh, yeah. were pretty cool. If you want to pe tell people that, that I thought was like a <laughs> pretty cool <laughs> Well, when I was a kid, my uh, family was in the business. So my father ran Universal TV. So uh, the reason that Marvel exists on TV and film is that uh, is that I always wore an Incredible Hulk uh, T-shirt. And he asked me what it was and thought it was cool. And, uh, and so he called Stan Lee and made the deal for Universal to get a bunch of Marvel rights and so they did um, Incredible Hulk, and I think they did another one. I think they did Captain America uh, as like a Sunday night movie or something. And anyway, that's how Marvel got into showbiz. 
uh, to begin with. I, they probably would have anyway. Yeah, like at some point, but you, you kind yeah. of were the the catalyst at that point. That's that's. Uh, a, yes, <laughs> I had a, I had a small role. To you had play. a small role. Were, did you have you ever think that if you had wearing any other t shirts that those like you, do you have any other t shirts you think back to where you go, man, if I was just wearing that more. That would have been a huge. Uh, you know, I I could have been wearing like a slinky T-shirt. That would not have been <laughs> as entertaining. Uh, I don't know. I've watched those go downstairs. Those are pretty exciting. Yeah, I think uh, I think I did ultimately. You know, I had there was a magazine called Heavy Metal, and that movie did get made, and it was not quite as successful. Oh, okay, I don't. Yeah. I'm not sure if I. <laughs> I'm not sure I know that one. Um, okay, so I, I want to talk to you about. Because I was reading your Substack, I was uh, listening to some stuff on podcasts. You have a pretty, you obviously, you know, kind of like to think where the puck is going. Using a, a hockey analogy, I guess, obviously with the the digital stuff. So we were talking just off air about how there's like, and, and also you had posted this on your Twitter. Where people go fo- can go follow you on, on Twitter, but. Um, you posted this chart about how there's like not comedy movies. There's not blockbuster. Yeah. Comedy movies anymore. And I remember you posted that and I went and looked at it because this is obviously something I'm interested in. Like when I got into comedy, period, like it was, you know, I, I very much was wanting to, you know, I've written all these scripts and all this stuff. And I was, you know, that's what I want to do. And then started doing like stand up and all that stuff. But like there hasn't been the last blockbuster comedy that I saw was Ted. Right. Like 12 years ago. Yeah, that's amazing. And, you know, and I think like, I'm like, I don't really like I go, I go to uh, theaters. I saw everything, whatever, all at once, everything everywhere, all at once in the theaters, you know, but I I feel like, you know, just like, I don't really talk about like movies are not just like people don't discuss them as much anymore. It's more TV, I think, which I guess uh, streaming might be, you know, somewhat of a culprit of, but like all my friends are comedians and it used to be that they would all end up in movies. Right. And now they're not like they don't even like they don't write like movies. Nobody's interested in them for movies. I was saying before, like Burt Kreischer has the machine coming out, which he's hoping will kind of rejuvenate movies for comedy. So I guess my, my question is, um, like, why? Like, wh- what do you think it is? Yeah, well, it's because people don't like to laugh anymore. They've just <laughs> lost that interest. The thing uh, is, they like to in, in comedy clubs. Like every you know, comedy clubs right now are are seeing like a real boom in the, like the in person yeah. comedy. And I don't. And it, there might be something related to the fact that like people legitimately are going to comedy clubs. Like someone came up to me. I was at a bar watching a game by myself, and some guy was like, "Yeah, we were just at the Beacon Theater watching this comedy show." And he's like this guy, Theo Vaughn, who's like not a racy, like, you know, he's not super edgy comedian by any standards. And he's like, you know, these guys, they really say stuff you're not allowed to say. Huh? Like there's like that big element where people are like, I have all these thoughts that I have that if I say I'll get in trouble. So I just need to go watch somebody say them so that I don't feel like crazy or something. I don't know. Right. Um, well, you know, most of my TV work has been in comedy and, um, uh, you know, and, and the problem is in movies where it's gone from 20% of the market to six, uh, but also in TV, like people are not really looking for the next South Park and they're not green lighting a lot of hilarious shows. And, um, I I really I think it is going to come back. I think we just have to figure out exactly how, but you know, it's like inevitable. You can't stop the tide of culture. Uh so I think it's temporary and we just have to figure out how to bring it back. Um and I do not think it's audience driven. I, I think it's just that uh the powers that be in Hollywood have kind of decided they don't like comedy. Like some people have said that comedy doesn't travel, but at Amazon, uh, Big Bang Theory was like our number one show in Germany. It was it was our number one show for years. Overdubbed, and so, uh, yeah, it was dubbed. Uh, so I don't really believe that. Um, I just think that you know mainly the people in charge are not comedy people. They're yeah. just not that into it. 
Yeah, but and having comedy, their background tends to be in drama. Their background tends to be in drama, like because I I try to understand like what kind of like cultural component is is because don't comedies generally like cost way less to make than you know like uh, comparable. Um, they cost somewhat less. I mean, like a primetime half hour, you know, is going to be, it could be around 3 million for a half hour and a hour, you know, could be six, but if you spend a lot, it could be 15. So right. comedies are, are cheap, way cheaper than the Game of Thrones, but, uh, but there are hours that are about the same. Can be you like know, same I don't, I don't drama. think so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cuz that um, always that always seemed like the thing with like Rob Schneider cuz like Rob Schneider is like still I don't know the degree to which he's making movies right now, but he has a very like, you know, impressive career and his whole thing as far as I understand was his movies just cost like, you know, 5 million bucks and they made right always more than that and they were just kind of like, you know, didn't have a ton of setups in them just you know and they were just all driven by him and they just always always seem to do well but yeah like none of my friends are i have some friends who are like literally some of the biggest comedians in the world well i do think that it's probably time for a kind of a new generation of comedy people you know just if you objectively look at who you would cast and how old everyone is um, you know, a lot of the people on YouTube and TikTok are there and they're popular and they're ready to do stuff. You actually have to like pull them away from their YouTube stuff. Like they don't yeah. want to stop. They don't want to discontinue that or take a break. But, you know, you have to say, look, it's only eight weeks and, you know, you get this and blah, blah, blah. Um you know, and so that group of people, I I think, you know, is the core of the revolution. And the question is just, what is the platform? Yeah. And wh you what, know, do you, what it, do you think that is? Is it an existing platform that is going to pivot, which I think is unlikely? Or, you know, do we create something new? Yeah, because I mean, I agree with that. Like for someone, you know, I, I do a podcast with Ryan Long and like all, all my friends do podcasts on that are just free on, I mean, this right here, like all, all this stuff, right. we do this stuff partially because, and I don't know if it was like a cultural thing uh, with like comedy was not like, um, I guess just people were scared of comedy because, you know, everything was so sensitive culturally, like especially during like the Trump era and stuff where, you know, it just was smarter business decision to go safer with everything. Like you can't get uh -huh in trouble with that but yeah so now everybody has a podcast you know they have these patreons everybody's expecting a new episode every week so for someone like say shane gillis to just take off for his podcast for two months right right people and i guess you know you can batch record them or record them remotely but for him you know like he has someone else who he does it with but yeah i i i i am very curious about that because i felt like we're in like a comedy dark ages for like in terms of yeah. movies specifically definitely it's like it's the worst it's yeah. the worst ever yeah but you know which which i like to think is also an opportunity because if you if you come out with the brand that really is the good fun edgy comedy then you're going to be the only one yeah you know it's not like there are eight other people doing this who right. know what they're doing of course um it is there an element with that where like a studio doesn't want to like the like if you if you work at a studio you don't even want to say green like just say my example like me and Ryan like they don't they would never want to give us a movie because they're like if we're wrong about this and we let you do your thing like we're all done we're all done for if if we miss the mark on that like is that just like a risk issue I mean that's true of every movie though yeah you know I mean if any movie bombs then you know, you take uh, you take career risk on anything. Right. So um, but, you know, generally your first best comedy is going to be better than like your fifth best drama. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so why aren't we making the first best comedy? Yeah. So you do think that that what was the figure you said? It was six percent. Yeah. And that's including a lot of family movies as comedies. So there's just there's no comedy movies anymore, basically. Yeah, basically. Yeah, I like. I mean, I honestly can't 
I can't like I, I I yeah I can't I can barely think of any. Yeah, it's... I mean like what was the great one last year? <laughs> I don't know. I well I know. you I know you people was out. I don't think it did that well. But I guess that's another problem, right? Is that it, because a lot of comedy is like comedy doesn't need to be in a theater like you'd maybe think like uh, everything everywhere all at once, even though that doesn't need to be, but it's a better experience or like definitely any sort of like these, you know, World War One movies like those do. So then they go on to Netflix, at which point they don't release how they do. Right, right. But um, I, so you, I guess you don't even know, like, I, is there a way that that could have been the biggest? I mean, I know it wasn't, but... Like, can it be these huge movies and we don't even know? Or is this strictly just like a box office thing? Well, you do get some report on on how they're doing. Yeah. Um, and some people have said, you know, actually the, the box office number exaggerates the difference a little more because there are there are some comedy movies being made, you know, straight for streaming. Um, OK, but it, it still isn't like, oh, it's the same. It's just that the comedy movies are going to streaming. Yeah. Uh, because, I mean, just look at the top comedians. Are they doing movies? I mean, like, is Chappelle doing a movie? Is Tim Dillon doing a movie? Like, uh, Schultz is nobody, the... yeah, Schultz, nobody is doing a movie. Schultz we just had on our, on our podcast, The Boys Cast, a few weeks ago, and he's been starting to get into, like, having parts in movies. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but I mean, yeah, someone like Tim Dillon, you know, he's making ten million dollars a year or something on his Patreon, and probably right, just like why, like why bother? Why bother? Yeah, it's so <laughs> weird. I guess movies just don't have like the king making power that they once had. But actually, you know, if he did a great movie, I I think it would be very good for him. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. Like, there's no way that people don't like comedies anymore. Yeah, and there, there's something about a great movie that that a great comedy movie that people remember and they quote that enhances your career in a way that you know little else does, or even a show, mm -hmm. you know, even a TV show. You know, if you had a Kirby enthusiasm or or whatever, um, uh, that can do a lot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I agree with the quote, the quotability thing. Like, you know, it's for me and my friends were, you know, something like Borat or like the um, Anchorman. Like, probably, I still, there's a comic, I'm not going to name him, but he does a Borat impersonation on stage right now, which is like an absolute cardinal sin <laughs> in yeah. comedy. But you're like, that's just like the legs something like Borat has, where you're like, it's still around, even though. So funny. Yeah, which is like just. Um, it's crazy. It's crazy. But yeah, I, I I always wondered like what needs to get people to go back to are, are theaters down in general, like since COVID, like is, have they not like really come back? Oh, they, they went way down. Uh, now they're, they're really coming back. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. So I theaters know they were, are back. theaters are back. Mm -hmm. So it's just basically everything but comedy. Yeah. Essentially. And that they're just not being greenlit. Yeah. You know, it's like it's like if you took if you had the next South Park and you brought it to networks around town, I I don't think you could sell it. And you, and even even with a very funny Jesus versus Santa pilot. Yeah. And not because they don't think it would be like would be losing the money. Like it's they're like are they like at the end of the day are they like this is a business and it's all just about like profitability or is there more like I always wondered this just like personally, like how much are they just like, this is a business. I don't think this is a good business decision or are they just like, we're not putting that out. You know, people have stuff that they're into. There is a fair amount of variety on different services, but, but there are, I think people have leanings that, that can be different from the audience and Hollywood kind of has a monoculture and and right now comedy is is disfavored and and in that in that monoculture and everyone just kind of seems to agree and be in the same mode. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's the thing that's by far the riskiest in terms of getting you, you know, in trouble with kind of like the 
internet mobs. I mean, I guess. Although with a movie, I mean, it's not like you don't get to see the movie before you release it. So that, right, right. Uh, you know, we can always watch it, and we know uh, uh, roughly how controversial it's going <laughs> to be. Uh, you're not going to be surprised. So I don't think some, you know, like if you're doing live stand-up or something. I guess you could be surprised, you know, someone could say something nuts, but you know, I don't, I don't think that's a yeah, huge issue. So it's just the appetite for just the people who are in charge. They're just, it's, it's almost it's just, just not like a the cyclical. Vibe. Yeah. It's just like a cyclical. Like, why thing. do we have so much true crime? Like we, America does not produce enough interesting crimes to do the number of true crime shows that apparently we need to do. Like yeah. we don't have a sufficient supply of crime. And, uh, <laughs> you know, there's Good just quote. like, there's I think this, a lot of people this, would argue with you on that. Yeah. There's like a huge demand for like true crime. Why is that? I don't know. It's just like, you know, what people are into, I guess. Um, so sometimes preferences do make a difference. I'm not saying there isn't a demand for true crime, but, I think there would also be a demand for um, for comedy, and yeah. but some, sometimes things tastes. are just out of favor. Yeah, it just tastes. Yeah, like I honestly find myself now I have uh, you know HBO Max. Although interesting, you come on the day that HBO Max becomes Max. Yeah, which, why is that? I'm sure you're. Why do they keep changing? It was it? huge, huge demand for the Max name. <laughs> like, why do they keep huge, doing that? I honestly, huge. I've been seeing commercials for it. And I honestly, I'm like, you're spending so much money to just like with all these huge A-list actors to say it's called Max now. And I'm just like, right. why? Well, you know, I, I think what it is, is that HBO is a very strong brand that was perceived as being a little prestige or elite. And that put a ceiling on it as to how many subscribers you could get. And so by going to max, uh, they just kind of start fresh. It doesn't mean anything to anyone. And um, so maybe it won't have any negatives. You gotcha. know, like HBO is kind of like fancy TV. So people love it, but it's like, you know, 30, 40 million households love it. And the rest, you know, mm -hmm. it's like maybe too fancy. Maybe too fancy. So I, I suspect that was the rationale. Interesting. Um, and speaking of uh, which, because I was reading your, your most recent uh, sub stack, which people can find. But so you you uh, ha this is re uh, relating to the, the comedy thing, but also you're saying you canceled Netflix because essentially, which today is also the day that Netflix, there's a lot happening in the TV world today. Netflix announced today that they're going to start charging all the freeloaders. Uh, right. In, in America and yeah like I find myself like I have Netflix I have HBO Max I have YouTube TV I have all these things and then the main thing I watch right now is just reruns of cops on huh. <laughs> on uh, stuff but so it's like are, are is there it's honestly almost exhausting that there's so many different and like someone will be like oh you've seen this show and I'm just like I can't sign up for another streaming thing Right. Like, is it, I. yeah. Like, are they ever going to figure Cause I know they're obviously all different companies. Like, I mean, I would actually, if there was something great, you know, if there was like, if we put together all these great comedy shows and movies, uh, and di basically did everything that Hollywood is not doing. Yeah. Uh, the, the other thing is Hollywood is at least last year did a lot of boring, nostalgic, political, uh, overly serious, dramatic, indie movies that bored everyone and bombed yeah and i just think that's like people being a little out of touch and like not not really up to the moment you know like everything everywhere was fun and had energy you know but i could name six movies that were like really nostalgic and political and that that's not i really don't think that's the mood people are in yeah, I, I think people would much rather see like a mo an updated like Cannonball Run, sure, uh, or something like that, like something a little rambunctious and fun. And fun, yeah. Is, is the problem I mean, the like the development time? Like, is it because I imagine 
that some of those movies you're referencing, you know, maybe started getting written when, you know, the political tensions were like at their highest. So they're like, this is what the country needs. And you're like, yeah, but this doesn't come out for five years or something. Right. Um, I don't know. I mean, that's it. That's the key to being a good, you know, picker of movies is you have to be able to look into the future and have a sense of what is what is not going to be passe two years from now. Right. So um, and there were a lot of there were a lot of a lot of misses last year. So yeah. what do you think about all the stuff that's going on with like the awards? Because I, I saw you were in your, your uh, sub stack. I believe you're saying how like awards used to, you know, if an award you won an award, that was, you know, pretty big. Yeah, for a I, th movie. I think it used to matter more and you used to be able to like plan your strategy a little more around awards. Um, but now viewership of award shows has really substantially declined, like by 70 percent. And so the upside is just much lower, like the free advertising of winning an Oscar, winning an Emmy is just a lot lower. Um, and so unfortunately, even though I, I really love that kind of movie, uh, that kind of special film, if you will, uh, it's you know, you probably, uh, if you were running a streamer or something, you wouldn't bet as much money on that category now. Yeah, because I, I do wonder, like, w the whole thing, w the stuff that they've done with the awards where they're like, yeah, the, we have all these new rules, like, in terms of all, like, the diversity stuff, which is basically what was, like, like me and Ryan came from Canada, which was, they were doing that stuff in Canada, like, when we were still there or whatever. But it seems like the moment that they say like, Hey, you need to check all these boxes. Then you're like, well then either all the awards you gave in the past were wrong because you were either ignoring these people. Right. Or then all the ones going forward are wrong. Cause you're now ignoring these people. And it's just like, not that they were the, these insanely legitimate institutions, but you're know, like, they were pretty big. Like, you know, the Oscars, I, when I was younger, I used to watch the Oscars all the time. And now People just are like, yeah, I don't know. It's the Oscars. Yeah, yeah, uh, yes, and they 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 have all sorts of new rules uh, that I'm not an expert in, but you know, presumably that excludes some titles, and uh, so the whole category, unfortunately, of Indian prestige, uh, you know, upscale movies is is really going through a, a very difficult time. Um, they also lost a lot of key like indie type theaters. Um, <clears throat> so that's not good for that category. So, you know, one of the worst, one of the, one of the toughest areas is if you're trying to get like an indie film made, like if, if you're trying to do tar or Manchester by the sea or something like that, um, you know, tough, yeah. Just tough like, road no. this year. E e oh, yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Let's, or let's... it would have to be made for a lot less because like what? Tar was made for like, I don't know, 30. And, um, you know, so like movies in that category might have to come down way down to like, you know, nine, something right. like that. Which is, can that be done? I mean, you lose a lot. It's so funny. <laughs> we made this movie in Canada. Like it was like the most like buyer bootstraps movie. And I think it would cost $800,000 and it was, we had explosions right. and all this stuff, but, uh, these were not, these were not, uh, big Hollywood movies. So let, let's, uh, pivot. I have a, some questions about technology. Cause I know you're really big into, into that. And then we're going to open up the phone lines in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. So, um, you, you're, you're obviously like, you're really into crypto NFTs. Uh, I've seen a lot of comments on AI and stuff. Uh, you said AI can be a helpful tool for writers. I think so. Yeah, Cause, I think cause it will I, be. Yeah, because I think there's like a lot of, obviously with the strike right now, right? So I, I think a lot of, this is like a lot more in focus and I guess whatever the public and just people kind of knowing about this stuff. But so in terms of, first off, in terms of the strike, because I, they talk about, they're like, yeah, one of the things the writers are on strike about is the use of AI. Mm -hmm. But like, I'm like, if, I just can't understand the like what scenario can they really use AI like to actually replace a writer? Well, I, I think they're worried about a couple of scenarios. One is, I guess, theoretically, where the AI just writes the script or does a rewrite or something like that. 
having experimented with it extensively, I I can say we're nowhere near that. It would have to it would have to get so much better. I mean, isn't um, that like replacing humans level, like to be able to just write a compelling like screenplay? Yeah, I mean, like, forget it. And yeah, like, it's, particularly it's... in comedy, like in comedy in particular, you're you're fully protected <laughs> yeah. because you know GPT is so not funny, and uh, and also there are like a million things it cannot joke about. Right. And... I I actually did when it came out. I took it for uh, you know trying to give it all these prompts or whatever. And I will say that if you prompt it correctly, it can. It can give you like a stand up routine of someone who's like probably their first week in comedy. <laughs> like, to be okay. honest, like where you go, like, I've been to like an open mic and I've seen some kind of joke uh -huh. here. But you're like, that's not competing with anybody who's doing this for a living in any way. It's not professional. No, yeah. no, not at all. No, no. No. But so, but in terms of how it could help, uh, and, I guess maybe we'll come back to the writer strike thing because you probably have some some insight into that. Because honestly, I don't think anybody even understands what's going on with that. But uh, actually, no, now that we're talking about it, what exactly? Because I'm sure you have some some fairly good insight. Like, what is uh, the main issue? Is it just like the streaming residuals and stuff like that? There are a number of issues. AI is one. Residuals are are another. Um, like, do you think this drags is... on? Uh, I think it's credible that it would drag on, but you know, you'd have to be psychic to know there's really no way to know, but there, there are certainly some strong arguments that it could go on for a little while. Yeah. Cause I see, I mean, just anecdotally, but in the New York, like stand up scene, like I see all these people who I've not seen or you very rarely seen cause they're like writers on Seth right. Meyers or something and they just they're like right. yeah, I have a job and I don't really need to do stand up and now they're like yeah I guess I'm back to doing stand up again <laughs> yeah yeah I think there are a lot of novels and plays being written and, oh, yeah. and stuff like that and like well that was, oh, sorry go ahead I was kind of wondering today I actually don't know the answer to this if you are a writer in the WGA and you write a movie can you then like at this point during the strike, can you direct and produce it yourself, like for yourself on your own account with your own money? Um, or is that verboten? I, I'm actually not I, sure about that. Like if, if, and you own the script? Like you own yeah, like I own the script, I own the movie, I'm the producer, and I'm a writer in the WGA, but I am, I am employing myself. Technically, I'm employed as a writer. But by myself, like I'm making yeah. a movie, so yeah, and I'm, I would getting, and I'm getting an amazing deal, right? <laughs> I imagine they would have some <clears throat> some beef with that. Like we were in the Canadian unions, and they were legitimately like so heavy handed in like the acting union, uh -huh. where we'd go to like film sketches, and like this is like we would be, you know, you go for the odd audition for some show or whatever, and like there'd be, you know, like the boys or something, like good shows, like great shows, because they were all filmed in Canada. And then you'd say, like, I'm going to go shoot, like, a short film with my with my friends, like, on a weekend or something, just, like, to go on YouTube. And you'd hear about it being, like, they say you can't do that. And I'm just like, this uh -huh. is not a commercial thing. You're like, I'm just doing a thing for my friends because there's not enough right. work and we're just, like, trying to make stuff because we like making stuff. Right. And they were literally like, yeah, you can't do that. And, you know, if we catch you doing this too many times, we'll kick you out of the union. Wow. Yeah. It was, okay. it was like, and they would send like people to like, like literal spies, like would show up and they, it was it's exactly how you expect huh. Canada to be. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was, uh, it was pretty wild, but, um, okay. So yeah, back to the AI thing and then we're going to open the, the phone lines up. But so you, AI helpful for writers in, in what sense? Just like, like gr grammar, like, or... I think I think it, it's helpful because you know you've got an assignment to write a script, you sit down at the computer, you tell the AI to write the script, then you email it to the studio, and you collect the paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> and they probably um, the, the studio has they just copy it, they plug it into their chat GPT, their right? AI, right? And, and then it the goes, this is the says, greatest. Hey, this is great. This is amazing. <laughs> this is the greatest possible script <laughs> yeah. a human could write. Theoretically, right. so they go, yeah, just just uh, write the check. Um, no, I I think 
I think as a practical matter, it, it'll be more like a plugin on Final Draft or Scrivener where it'll help you with stuff. Like, um, you know, if you're working on an outline, it can say things like, you know, your inciting incident feels a little late or, you know, you maybe you need a, you know, some uh, beat at the end of the second act or, you know, like give you a little coaching and a little structural ideas yeah. uh i could totally see that and giving giving you a bunch of facts you know like what is the range of a learjet right you know just, just like the stuff just like where google you would, like that you would hire a consultant for like yeah how, right like, law and order has like an actual detective just to make sure it's right like realistic or whatever isn't every ai model like isn't it theoretically trained on every movie that's ever been made uh, I I don't believe so, but I don't know. Oh, okay, but you could you could just somehow you could get a database of every script that's ever been written, or say yes. like you know the top whatever ten thousand movies of all time, and you can say here just here's your training. Do this. I think more, what you but... would have to do is develop some way of helping the system understand when a scene or a script is good. Yeah. As opposed to just reading a thousand scripts and not having any idea which is good, which is bad. I, I think it would be helpful to have them be annotated. But anyway, yeah, you could do that in theory. Um, okay. All right. So I, I want to actually get to, and we'll open the phone line shortly. But um, so you're a big crypto guy, big NFT guy. That's actually how we we, we uh, had a little back and forth because you had an NFT project. Oh, but yeah. So, okay. So this is kind of, and I'm very interested by this because I, I have some NFTs. Um, some basketball ones, some top shots. Oh uh, wow! Okay, yeah, they're not doing great, but um, it's fine. I, I bought them. I bought them for twenty years from now, and I figured if people care about these, then they'll, they'll be a good thing to have. But so you have a, I, I guess, like you know, your prognostication is that a lot of the film world is going to be kind of there's going to be some sort of Web three NFT tie in. Uh, I, I guess maybe that's the... well. I I think there's an opportunity in uh, like right now the entire Hollywood business for the most part is centralized and it's a it's a vertical stack and so you just go to one person in an office and you say can I make my movie and there are like six people like that around town and that's the business and. Um, I think the opportunity in the future is to disaggregate that and decentralize it so that it would be more like more like Kickstarter, except with real equity in the movie, ownership in the movie. So you would like create a detail page on the web and say what the movie is going to be. You know, it's going to be me and, you know, Ryan Long and it's called this and, and we, we have a script this is the director, this is the budget. And people buy in. And so instead of looking for a green light from one of six people in town, you're you're just looking for 10,000 people around the world to green light your movie. And it's not a vote because it doesn't matter how many people don't want to green light your movie. They, they don't get a vote. You know, the only people who get a vote are the people who put money into the movie. So uh, I think that a disaggregated, you know, group of global investors and fans would tend to be more like tend to be less subject to like weird cultural anti-comedy moods than like six people. Right. And so and when you say vote, like that's like a vote in terms of like actual like artistic, uh, you know, questions. It's not a vote. It's it's just like having a an IPO or something. You're right. raising money. Like just you gotcha. Just like that's you're, they're voting with their wallets essentially. They're just yeah, it, yeah yeah exactly exactly. So yeah, there's no voting. It's not a democracy. But if you can find some group of fans that are passionate or some investors, whether they're fans or not, but they believe that this is a good commercial prospect. And you have no idea who they are. You know, they may be LARPing as frogs on the Internet and they live in Dubai or they live next door. Who knows? Uh, but, you know, who cares? Um, 
But and I think that kind of disaggregated system would would actually have a lot of benefits for creators. I think it would give them a lot more uh, control and a lot more ownership. And you know, for people I talk to, those are those are two things that people really want. Yeah, and that right that now. that gives an actual like share in the profits of a, of a. Yeah. So by ownership, I I mean you'd have a lot more upside. So you know, if you made you know Star Wars you become a billionaire instead of, you know, doing it for Netflix, in which case you would not. So, right. you know, one of the richest people in Hollywood is Haim Saban, who did, you know, kind of like one show, but the show was Power Rangers and he owned it. And the reason, you know, he's a billionaire and someone who did 40 shows for Nickelodeon is definitely not is the ownership and i think with an open marketplace uh you'd get a much better deal crazy i, I didn't even know that this is one guy how did he start he just started just per, what do you like uh just produced a teaser of a power rangers and then just sold it well it was actually a japanese show and he bought the rights to it and uh cut out all the parts where they weren't in the outfits yeah and uh you know created new sort of interstitial parts and and sold the new show oh gotcha. and uh you know brilliant and then great you, idea you can just, and then you can overdub it in any language right yeah yeah that's because their face faces are covered yeah yeah in uh i don't know if you've ever seen just for laughs gags one of canada's greatest exports uh artistic exports ever but it's a prank show like just for laughs the comedy festival i think it's what keeps the whole business afloat is they just have this prank show, but nobody ever speaks in it. So it's like syndicated in almost every country in the world. Because, oh, wow. Yeah. Cause nobody ever speaks in it. Um, all right. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to, I mean, they're great pranks. They're going to be wrong. They fill them all in like Quebec. And some of them are, some of them are deranged. Like some of them legitimately is some woman is, you know, like, uh, holding like a baby stroller or something. And then she'll be like, Hey, to some guy, can you like hold this? And then he'll be like, sure. And then she like lets it go into traffic. And then like, so oh, the, guy, wow. the guy thinks it's just like a baby died. And, <laughs> <laughs> like, it's so crazy. And it's one of the most popular shows um, in Canada. So anyways, the, the phone lines uh, are open. If anybody wants to call in, ask Roy a question. I have some questions from, oh, you know what? Here we go. We got a question right away. Uh, please give me one moment, Roy, while I connect them. Hello? Hey, how's it going? Hey, one second, yes. please. Hey, one sec. Who? Just let me connect. All right, you are on with Roy Price. Who am I speaking with? Uh, I'm just calling from Texas. Uh, I had uh, two questions. Uh, the second one is for Royce, but the first one is uh, Danny. You yes. mentioned something that is shared amongst and common amongst more than a billion people around the world, and that is the digital media overload overload yeah just way too much to watch now what i'll suggest is not a solution for the whole problem it's just what's worked for me and i like mini series okay something yeah. where it's like yeah yeah so i mean that um like, the showtime mini series was the best show i've watched in a long time on hbo it's honestly the reason i still have hbo is the lakers show yes so I, I that's what I enjoy because it's like you gave me six ten episodes and like it's all really good and then I also do like the format of uh, where, uh, like well how they did True Detect Detective where it is a mini series and then next season is of the same thing but completely different sort of if you know yeah. what I mean yeah yeah I so gotcha that's anyways you my, got a question that's for Roy? Just my suggestion yeah so my question for Roy was. Uh, Speaking of, because it's been a few years since I used uh, Amazon Prime to watch films and movies and shows and stuff like that. But the one I did watch was uh, Man in the High Castle. Uh, is Roy is familiar with working on any of it? Or, uh, I or? remember it, but I, I wasn't, <laughs> you know, I had uh, like 50 shows every year and many movies, mm -hmm. so... You know, yeah, I don't. So it's, it's nothing specific about the the movie itself, but it is a question that has been t asked time and time again about people who love consuming media. And I read the book 
and I watched the show. And I don't remember if I ever watched like the third season, if there was one, but there is a constant thing uh, being asked, why don't film adaptations of written novels like not be accurate to what was written? There's always changes. And, and Did you think it was not accurate? Um, it was like it, it was accurate in the sense of like it, it matched, but just in terms of the actual plot itself, maybe in like especially just reading when I read the book, I seemed like oh, maybe it would have not been long enough for an entire you know show with multiple. Oh, seasons. yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, with that, book, a... go ahead. Yeah, with that book, it's uh, it's the narrative itself in the book is is not that substantial, it's basically like setting up you know, the premise and there are some things that happen, but you, you really have to um, take off from there. And, and our narrative was mostly subsequent to the, the uh, events depicted in the book. So, um, you know, it had to diverge somewhat, but, but I, I think we did try to stay true to it in essence. And um uh, you know, which we try to do generally, like with Bosch, is based on a series of novels about an LAPD detective by Michael Connolly, and Michael yeah, was. I'm familiar with. The, I'm familiar yeah. with the show, and I liked it. Yeah, so Michael was an EP on the show, and he was involved with every single episode, and you know that's how I would prefer to do it because. Uh, and unless a book is incredibly obscure, assuming a book or a book series has a lot of fans, you know, they're kind of the core audience. They have a certain expectation. So you, you don't want to totally blow that. And uh, so so we try to work closely with, um, you know, the author or somebody who represents the author. And I mean, I guess you probably yeah, don't know. I... Uh, sorry, caller, but like, I guess you don't know when you're making a series like Man, the High Castle went four seasons, right? But you don't know that, so you you know you can't be like, oh, we're gonna like you have to obviously at some point be like, okay, we're gonna have to go in some direction here because, like the the original, like you know if you um, do it from a book or whatever, you're like, well, we did that in season one, and now we have to kind of continue on essentially. But yeah, we went way beyond the narrative of the book. Right, right. right. Um, all right, thanks, all. Hey, hey, oh, you have anything? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, what is it? Uh, it's just with, like, I think uh, with my certain generation, the first time we noticed it was when they started putting out the uh, Harry Potter film out in the theater. And that was when people were, like, in the immediate slap tapping to his month. Um, just to tie in the first two questions, and I'll, then I'll hang up after I ask, uh, is there, uh, what is it? Do you think if people wanted, like, more accurate, like, adaptations or something like really well condensed wouldn't uh streaming services kind of lean towards the mini series format just so people aren't overloaded because it does seem like having to make multiple seasons seems like it's just uh it's not really self-fulfilling and it's going to run itself empty all right oh. yeah that's color. Hmm. i mean yeah maybe maybe so because, I mean, yeah, if you do enough seasons, you'll run through the narrative of any book. Right, yeah. Is there an actual, like, conscious... Because I, I've heard, like, the... um, the, the, They make content that's essentially, like, second screen content. Like, where, where essentially, like, it's meant to just watch while you're also on your phone. Like, doing something else. Oh, like, you what know, do you think? What do you think about that? I, I, I mean, I imagine writers must just hate that idea, but it must be just like, that's how it is. You know, that's something people used to talk about. I, I feel like around 2009 or something, 2010, people would talk about, like, transmedia and second screen. And uh, it, thankfully, I, I haven't heard either of those terms for like a decade. Oh, okay. Uh, Cause I, I thought all of that was like a horrible idea. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I mean, it does seem like a terrible idea, but you know, like I know a lot of people who are, who would never watch um, like a subtitled movie or anything with subtitles. Cause they're just like, I get lost. Cause I wind up on my phone for 10 minutes of it and I don't speak that language. And then they're, you right. know what I mean? And then they like come back to it. 
and they're just i mean i guess it's one of those things where just like that is just how it is people's attention is so difficult to uh so difficult to i guess like harness in with you know phones and stuff yeah that is true although people watch more subtitled content i think than ever really yeah like all this uh korean stuff on netflix and you know there there's more popular foreign content in the united states uh than ever really than ever. interesting okay we got another caller here one moment please hello 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 hey how's it going uh hello? you are hey what's up you're on with roy who we're we speaking with uh pete Hey, Pete, how's it going? Going good. Hey, just wanted to uh, really quick kind of give some thoughts on like the whole not having a lot of comedies out right now. Um, but also, uh, I heard Roy, did you do Recess and like Her- the Hercules show for Disney? Yes. Yes. And Kim Possible. And yeah. Then, uh, so yeah. those are some of my favorites as a kid. So thanks. Oh, that's great. I like those shows a lot. Yeah, I love those shows too. Uh, but yeah, they're super fun. Uh, but yeah, for the lack of comedy, I just feel like, you know, like the people who made those types of films, like the filmmakers, like the Judd Apatow's and like Seth Rogen people, like I feel like because they're very progressive people, they're just not, they're like trying to like distance themselves from like doing that type of work now. Like if you look back like 10, 20 years ago, like super bad, where the Millers, hangover like those were really good comedies but the people that made those comedies they just don't want to like touch it anymore because like you know like people like jimmy kimmel like even like they're all they all used to be funny people but now they're like ashamed of it or something because of like well they become like activists a little bit yeah it's like that activism and comedy stuff is just such a bad mix right like it kills it like i mean like people love those movies and they love the jokes in those movies. Like, I don't know how many times I've like heard people repeat the, the lines from those movies or just like sitting in the theaters, watch them and everyone's cracking up because everyone finds that stuff funny. But like nowadays it's like, you almost can't like admit to liking that type of comedy because it's like, everything's just very progressive now. Well, like, see, I, don't, I, don't... I don't know if Roy, if Roy would, sorry, go ahead. You know, I don't even understand why it's really a political thing or has it's not political, but has kind of a political tinge to it. I I think people can uh, appreciate those comedies and see them in the theater. And and so I I think they will come back. I think there's a resistance right now but uh you know we just have to figure our way around it and then i I think it'll be it will become clear that there is there is a substantial market demand you know and then i think it'll it'll get back to normal and will Uh, it just take one like is that all it really needs is just one you know i mean maybe one they could say that's a crazy fluke so we we might have to do it two or three times (laughs) (laughs) All right, so two or three, and then we're right. back, if, baby. If somebody were to make like, the, yeah, if, if somebody could just make like the next American Pie, like obviously not another yeah. one, but like the yeah. next thing that's like that, like I feel like that would really help things, like sort of like get back into like okay, comedy's a good thing, and we can yeah have those movies again. We but, are like, on I the think same people are just afraid. Yeah, yeah, and then like, I, as yeah. far, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. But yeah. As, as as far as like uh danny what you were saying like not like being able to create comedy or whatever i feel like the best way to do it now maybe is like if you and ryan do like your own thing and just kind of produce your own show um i don't know where you could put it out but like i've seen youtubers just sort of put out like free content and then they like that just gets like way more publicity than even whatever's, you know, the newest show on Netflix these days. Yeah. I mean, the problem with producing your own show, if you want to, like, I mean, if people know who are Boys Cast subscribers, but on the Patreon, but we actually did put out a full 45 minute TV show recently that's kind of like a Kenny versus Spenny thing. But, like, to make that 
that was actually fairly cheap. But if you want to make something like a movie, like it's it's just it's a lot of money and it's a lot of time. Like to write a movie takes a long, like a, a good movie takes a long, long time. Like it's just it's so right, and, you know. And the problem is sometimes you're like like we've had even offers to make stuff where it's unclear where it will even end up. And we go like, we, I don't even know if we want to spend three months on a thing and then nobody sees it, even if we get paid for it. You're like, that, that's barely yeah. doesn't even seem worth it. You know? So, yeah, I, I get that. I mean, that's, that's gotta be like a hard thing to just navigate. But yeah, I mean, like, I don't know. I, I just feel like if you guys just keep trying things or whatever, like something will stick eventually. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. That's the hope too. Um, all right. Th- thanks for calling. Appreciate it. Thanks Pete. Yeah, yeah, I th- like we we have had people come to us and legitimately say like, "Hey, we want to make this thing." And but then when you find out where it's going to go, it's like on some streaming service you've never like, you know, like an app or something. Like all those we had a thing um the movie that we actually made in Canada ended up on uh Canal Plus. You know what that was? Yeah, it's in France. It, it it was. I don't think it exists anymore. But it's like every <laughs> they're all like formerly existing uh, these apps. These little like these bite. They all wanted to do this like bite sized thing, and then and th- it's interesting because it was before TikTok. Actually, all these things happened, so they somewhat were like f- foresaw this kind of super short attention span stuff. But I guess it's just so hard to. I think execute. the I think it would be interesting to say like okay we've got you know three weeks we have three million dollars we have like you and ryan and and trevor wallace yeah and somebody and we're it's all in manhattan go yeah uh you know and it's like it's a little bit like after hours and let's figure it out Sure. And, you know, and then you either go to Sundance, so it has to be a little artsy. Um, and, you know, you see, you do it as a movie. It's not a TV show. And, uh, you know, I I think the prospects of that would be pretty interesting, you know, with a good filmmaker, if you wind up with a good script. Um, you know, it could be part of a program that can start to recover comedy. I mean, obviously, eventually you want to be making your comedies 15 or 20, but, uh, but you know, it would be interesting to do that. Yeah. I mean, for like, yeah, I don't, I don't know the whole necessarily behind the scenes, like cost, but that seems like more than enough to make a comedy movie. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, we're running around and it's, you know, people in rooms and the occasional scene, you know, going down the street or in a taxi, but you know, it's all domestic scenes. There are no, Godzilla there are no spaceships uh but nevertheless we find ways to you know to make it funny and relevant yeah yeah like well like we just made we did make like for our patreon for the boys cast like we're, we're basically we put out a show every subscriber tier it's similar to like if you know that show Kenny versus Spenny if you remember that uh-huh. show which was uh to two guys from Toronto as well but uh I mean, we made the whole show for the main expense was we were putting these stupid like drawer things together that we bought these like pieces. It's called Bugman versus Bugman. We bought these like really shitty, uh, the lowest rated thing on Home Depot, like drawers. And then we had to like as a competition. And like that was the main expense for the whole thing. Uh-huh. <laughs> it was right. like these like right. $300 drawers or whatever. So it can be made for TV. But yeah, movies different like movies. Just like equipment and whatever, all the, all that stuff, um, all that stuff. It, it is. Uh, I mean, it's a lot cheaper than it used to be. And I, I love a show like uh, Nathan for you. I mean, yeah. very funny. Nothing expensive about it. You know. Did you catch the rehearsal? Did you see his new show? Yeah, I mean that's like fun too but you know in kind of a no. high-minded <laughs> yeah, way that was that was very it's like very for all your like sartre phd candidate <laughs> very high concept uh, yeah. <laughs> all right we got another call here oh here we go hello one second please hello okay hey what's up hey how's it going all right you are on with roy who am i speaking with Hey, so uh, I just have one sort of specific question about uh, the boys show on Amazon. Um, 
season one was a pretty awesome concept, just like regular dudes taking on corrupt superheroes, right? So my mm-hmm. question is like, why did you guys or whoever wrote it over at Amazon decide that season two was just going to be about Donald Trump? Well, I left before season two. <laughs> there you go. So I, I, I can't speak to that. Okay, I just was wondering if you had any insight as to why everybody was like, "Let's take this show that everybody likes and this great." Is that what, is that what, I haven't seen the second let's season. Let's just make season two about Trump. Well, probably because that's what's going on in the world, and it just seemed probably, you know, they probably thought that that was maybe the move at the time. I guess I don't know. All right, thanks, caller. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. That's uh, t- like TV obviously moves much quicker in terms of like culture. I feel like uh, in, in in that yeah uh, in that extent. Um, all right, we have a question from one of our uh, from one of our uh, patrons on the show. Uh, he says, uh, "What piece of IP do you most regret not having a chance to make during your time with Amazon?" Oh, not having a chance to make not having or, a chance to make or maybe something like you passed on not right? making not making yeah um you know toward the end of when i was at amazon we there was kind of a mandate to uh really focus on like fantasy and sci-fi uh and try to get you know a big tentpole hit and um so during that time, we definitely saw some good shows that we could not do because they didn't, you know, qualify under that. And uh, the morning show was one. Kaminsky Method was one. I definitely would have done that. Um, and Yellowstone was one as well. Oh, so like they were those shows were were kind of like, how does it work? Like, are is it is they are they brought to every studio and then it's like a bidding process or is it just they go along and just everybody just declines until they finally find someone who uh, morning show? They set up a conference room at CAA, you know, the agency and and all the networks came on a particular day. Yeah. And uh, uh Kaminsky method they came over to our place so presumably they went everywhere and, and did they have I a pilot remember. at that point or a script yeah I th- I think so I think so yeah and it was Chuck Lorre and Michael Douglas and of course they made a great show um you know they're very talented and um uh yeah and then Yellowstone I don't remember but um that worked out well yeah, that worked out pretty well. And what I'm sure a lot of people are are interested, but like what extent is Jeff Bezos like involved in these like when you say that they wanted like some giant tent pole fantasy, like is is that in any way coming from him or is he just kind of overseeing everything and like Well, we wouldn't meet that frequently, but he definitely he had a point of view and and he definitely was supportive of that uh tentpole sci-fi fantasy uh preference point like, of view i, I guess i think like, there was yeah go ahead sometimes you 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 like luck is a factor like sometimes you make a lot more progress in one area than in another so in comedy we we did relatively well and we won a bunch of awards and we made a lot of progress and in in genre drama it just it just took a bit longer and yeah. uh, I think, you know, eventually they started making a lot more progress. And we did, you know, the first big one was probably The Boys. The Boys, yeah, because The Boys is a huge hit. Like, I just wonder, like, is he the type of guy who's so busy? Like, is he, like, is he watching TV and he goes like, yeah, we should do this? Like, is he in front of his TV just being like, more of this kind of thing? <laughs> he he, <clears throat> he definitely watches TV and has opinions about it. I, I don't think he's watching TV, like, all the time. But, no. <laughs> yeah, you know, not, yeah. enough enough <laughs> he's enough. got a point of view yeah interesting um cool and uh <laughs> this is a funny question i don't you're probably not gonna have any has nothing to do with you at all but multiple people asked the same question which was why was ring of power so shitty uh, i had nothing to do with that <laughs> yeah, I, no i know you had nothing to do with that i don't know why people i think people are just so although i guess that's maybe an indication of like what's going on with um 
what's going on with like uh just whatever the world where where they're just because it's all recycled like is the whole recycling ip is that just because that's a safe uh bet for the most part because like i see a lot I yeah i mean it, it really attracts customers you yeah. know it's it's much easier than doing an original and you know i think there's something unfortunate about that but uh you know i also think it's true um and i think the the main problem ring of power had was that galadriel was a little hard to access as a character you know she was, it seemed like a very distant uh protagonist and uh, I haven't maybe, seen maybe it. Maybe that'll evolve. <laughs> oh yeah, it's, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm I mean, not a I'm not a big fantasy guy. Um, right. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I don't know what it is, but I've always been just like super into. I mean, not what it is. It's just I'm really into into comedies and stuff. But yeah, like I was looking before before the show, like at the biggest movies of 2023, and it's just like all they're just remaking everything. Sequels you know superheroes but like and like the remakes of stuff constantly yeah like you know white man like that's a movie andrew schultz was in white man can't jump uh -huh. and i uh, i i don't know like i because as someone who wants to write like you know as someone who like you know i've written many scripts and like that was you know i had a goal of that to get into that thing and then you're like they don't even take new ideas like what's the best case scenario like you just get hired to rewrite like to yeah know, the slinky movie or, yeah, or whatever you know but yeah. you're, like, you're like they don't take new ideas like could there can is there somewhere out there like the next lord of the rings or next like i mean the thing is like it, it you know most of the movies used to be original yeah you know like whatever like if you go back in time like ghostbusters was not based on anything no they just came up with an idea called ghostbusters uh, you know, Stripes, Fletch, you know, Tootsie, whatever. Everything. The Caddyshack, Animal House, like, they're all hilarious and not based on anything. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, as part of our revolutionary plan, we need to include that. Yeah, because I'm just like, it's so, I, I don't want to say it's discouraging, because I'm just like, whatever, obviously people like that i guess there's some comfort like i don't even like does that check the nostalgia box for them to re-release like an old not re-release but like put out something like a white man can't jump again like i, I don't even know if that does check I the nostalgia. Don't know. yeah is it even nostalgia like when did that come out it came out in like 1990 i mean it would be for some like maybe for me it would be nostalgic so like, yeah like who's nostalgic I'm trying to think who's nostalgic for it, uh, I guess. Um, I don't know, but audiences do use it as some kind of indicator that, like, this is a thing worth paying attention to because people probably put a lot of money in it and it has a star and everybody kind of gets organized around something that is a major IP. Yeah. And they're just, uh, yeah. I mean, I guess that someone makes sense. Like, and I, I was, I don't know if it was, uh, if it was on the podcast I was listening to, you on, but like, it, it seems it used to be that they would just get some star and stars could just basically make a movie. Is that right. becoming less, less of the case? I feel like that's much less the case. It's not zero. I think there are some stars like Brad Pitt or Tom Cruise um but a lot of the stars i feel like a lot of the stars are older um you know and they became stars in an earlier time when you could become a star yeah. but you know who is you know who are the stars under 35 i think it's harder to become a star in that zone today so you know and they're all tv stars right all the people who i can think of who are like big younger celebrities i think are all from television at this point like i think of like stranger well, things or i think you could argue scarlet is a star and um yeah but she's not under 35 no but you know she's kind of kind of in that zone yeah. um so that may be an exception but you know it's just like fewer than before um 
and you know there, there's just a lot more media now there are a lot more tv shows there's tiktok there's youtube it's harder to have everybody in america focus on you you know for a couple of weeks yeah um you know like there's nothing in our society akin to being on the cover of rolling stone in 1990 right you know yeah like, yeah that's just non-existent anymore yeah that would be like if everybody in america only watched your tiktok for like a week <laughs> yeah you know it is so <laughs> yeah it's like i i it's funny you say tiktok because tiktok is actually trying to i don't spend a lot of time on there i have no idea what's going on for the most part right. i post my stuff and uh, i'm just like i don't i don't get it I, but but it is interesting where someone is can be you know so like they'll show the way the algorithm works is they'll like show you somebody and then as long as the algorithm is essentially blessing you, like it's like some sort of like Mayan God or something where they're like they to that person where they keep showing you and they go, OK, that person's hugely famous. But then they just take them away like they'll just do that mm. where so that person is probably all of a sudden being like, man, I, was, I got so much heat on me and then it just disappeared. And they probably and it, there's no rhyme or reason for it. I guess just they just the way the algorithm works is like what extent is do algorithms play right now with even you know idea generation and not idea generation but like the type of because i imagine that you know amazon prime has some sort of algorithm for predicting things and so does netflix and whatnot so the people who design that theoretically uh like the way it works like because i'm sure the things that do popular based on this algorithm they're going to make more of those algorithms aren't really used in development non-development like you don't no. go look at the things that are kind of doing well on for example like prime or whatever that was all baloney really that was that, yeah that was all baloney interesting so it was just yeah. straight up with in terms of development is just you're the guy and they say we you know we're betting on roy so roy go pick us like some winners like is that well i mean you have a whole team and sometimes you will run it by the audience before uh, you green light it so you can either make a pilot or you can you know take other versions like the premise or a longer version of the premise and run it by a thousand people and just see what they think uh, so we set up something called Amazon preview which was heavy users of, of the service plus big IMDB users and you could send them premises or casting ideas or you know kind of a paragraph synopsis or whatever you want yeah and you know they would give feedback and and that was that was you know not unhelpful uh and then we did pilots for a while but then we actually stopped doing that because it, it just delays you too much yeah and it was it was a competitive disadvantage because other people were not doing it and so is that, uh, and then that was kind of like the modern version of test screenings. Cause I, I've never heard of that before where you would just like IMDB users would just send them like, uh, like it, what would it be like if everybody was like hated this or everybody loved it, then you would just be like, okay, that's the right path to go. Like you're not necessarily making decisions based off of it, but you'll be like, yeah, that's a, we can go down this path now. I mean, it's good to know what people think or at least what their reaction is to what you showed them. Right. You know, if if you show a premise to a thousand people and and one thousand people hate it. Right. Probably good to know. Good yeah. to know. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Did you have any examples of that? Like where the, it was like widely hated or loved like ideas that you would send and you go like this is. You know, I, I would say this. The the important thing is how many people the important thing is that there are people who love it. Mm -hmm. you know like it's better to have 30 percent of people love it and 70 percent of people just ambivalent uh, don't care whatever yeah. versus a hundred percent of people think it's a seven right right yeah because those people are just there's there's no it, they don't care yeah there's, there's no like you emotional know? attachment all right we got yeah. a caller we're gonna make this one the last one of the night one okay. second please hello Hello. Hey, hey, what's up? Uh, one second, please, while we connect you to Roy. All right, you are on with Roy. Last caller, then I, who am I speaking with? Uh, this is Zaycar G. Zaycar G, <laughs> um, how you doing, man? 
this is hey good uh i apologize it was kind of off topic i've been in and out of the the show tonight but i was curious um roy what are your what are your thoughts on social programming and like kind of the role that media plays in that or do you have any thoughts i'm just curious what's social programming uh social programming being like the messages that um get kind of brought into the zeitgeist through entertainment uh, uh to you know i guess like political messages stuff like that like you know yeah, political or cultural right. messages and it's yeah. okay if you don't have an opinion i'm just curious all right you know my theory is that comedy for some reason comedy and politics like uses the same part of the brain because I know this is an idiosyncratic theory, but here's why. Because so many careers basically go like this. Very, very funny. And you become, you know, famous and successful. Then step two, become super political. Okay. Now, never write anything funny ever again. Okay. <laughs> and for some reason, you know, the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or whatever, like pushes the funny out of your brain unless <laughs> your name unless your name is Norman Lear. Yeah. You know, like there there are like five people, you know, who can like do it both. They think about politics and comedy. But like I try not to think too much, you know, or get too involved with politics because because I I think I've seen this like many times. And uh so that's kind of my theory of it. I, I feel there should be kind of a church and state where um you you kind of deal with politics at, at you know somewhat at, at your own risk yeah i uh anything else there right. caller you got anything else there? uh no I, I guess that's i was just it's so it's kind of for you it's a it's just a it's a result of a perverse incentives kind of a deal where you get a taste of fame and some, some success and well and people want to listen to you kind of finger it just it kind of yeah it feeds in on itself all right th thanks sir. there he is sorry roy i'm stupid oh we lost him and he's back hey, hey sorry about that i'm a dummy no I'm, i meant to kick out the other guy from the to just remove him <laughs> anyways sorry about that we are back with roy apologies for that so yeah the thing you were saying because i was honestly such a the politics and the comedy thing is the smartest comedians always uh, like the, especially comedy actors like you know like someone like an Adam Sandler nobody knows his politics and it, right right and it's like by design because the moment like there especially social media is the worst for that because it gave these people like this instant access where you could, you know, put out an idea and then people would be like, yeah, you're right. And mostly when you're a famous person, people are not disagreeing with you unless you're going whatever against the the grain. But like, yeah, the, that you're like totally right about that, where like the mixture of comedy and politics can be so poisonous, but also because comics are supposed to be ob like objective as well. Yeah, right? and it's, it's supposed to be funny. I, I don't know. It's just like I've seen it a million times. And he, of course, you could come up with this and that exception. And I'm sure there are more exceptions than I, I realize. But there's boy, honestly there, of... there's honestly not to be like you. You are pretty spot on on it because we talk about this like Ryan and I talk about this a lot because we get, you know, approached by you know, things like the, like the daily wire, like the daily wire has, you know, they have tons of money right now. Like they're throwing around real sums of money and they'll be like, Hey, do you want to come do like a th project or whatever? And they're like, we're making movies. We're doing all this stuff. But then you're like, well then, you know, you can't, you can't be like, Oh, I'm impartial politically when I'm making content for the daily wire. Right. You just, you, right. you can't. And that's like, you might not even necessarily, well, there's no way you'll make something for them without having to take some kind of position that they because the stuff that they're doing is is that right. But like it, it's so. Yeah. Like, I mean, Trump should have should, was a message to everybody in entertainment where you're like, look, it's like you don't need to give your opinions on on everything, uh, especially politics, because one, you just you alienate half of the country. That's the thing. You know, half the people 
are not with you, whatever political position you take. So, and I, I really think it, it changes you. You know, if you get up in the morning and you're thinking about, you know, whatever, you know, uh, marginal tax rates or, you know, whatever political issue, uh, I, I do think it pushes something out of the mind that is the, uh, you know, the, yeah, the like the part way, that makes jokes. Or the something. part that makes jokes. Yeah, for sure. You're like, what's what's funny about Martin? Yeah, it's just I totally agree because there's there's not a lot of comedians who have been able to like they, not that they don't exist, but you just you run. It's such a risky endeavor. And the fact is, most comedians, you don't really know their politics like they obviously have them. But the moment you know them, you're just like it puts a stink on any commentary they have about anything. Cause you're like, well, you're just a soldier on the side of the debate essentially. So it'll be like, obviously you think that. And then also comedy is that there's an element of surprise, right? So if I know what, how you lean ideologically, I probably know what you're about to say. And then if you say the opposite of that, then I know you're lying because you kind of, it's almost like, have you heard the John C. Riley thing where he's like, I don't, he's like not on the internet. Like, He's got no social media. He doesn't like to do interviews, really, because he wants the mystique of of himself almost to like exist, so that all the characters are, are, can almost like live. If that makes huh. sense, yeah. And I, I kind of like he has like he's like secretive, you know. So his his, his a actual... lot of people do not have social media. I think I think George Clooney and um, but you know they're they're like a half dozen major major people who who don't do it at all. Yeah, I I mean that those are the smart ones because I feel like especially if you're a real like a list ce celebrity, you have so little to gain from that, and you have so much yeah. to lose. So much to lose. Yeah. Although, uh, did you did you miss my banger today about uh, about cocaine bear? Cocaine bear? No. What was that? We're going to now do a series of movies which are like substance plus animal. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah like, yeah. Is, is that how Hollywood works? Like, that's what we have coming up. Oh, like, yeah. Like, we've so got to do crack bats. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're just on it. We're on it. That is actually come to think of it. So I was looking at the top movies of this year. So that <laughs> that is that was like, I think, one of the maybe the 10th uh, highest grossing film this year. Uh huh. Something like that. It's so, a good idea. Yeah. So, and I feel like that kind of runs in like a. I mean, that's obviously a comedy. It's. It seems like yeah, a, a bit of an anomaly that they made that. I get like. Yeah. It do, it does seem like an anomaly to me. I mean, it it is not nearly as polite as most of the stuff that is coming out. Yeah. Like I remember, we saw the trailers for that, and then I was like, oh, this is going straight to whatever. Like this isn't going to be, you know, on on in theaters but i guess it's like when they put those those uh those numbers up like the the box office like i imagine that's that doesn't factor in any streaming although i guess that factors in like rentals uh the box office numbers yeah like because like the if you look up like the top movies of uh of 2023 or whatever it, it has like 780 million or something yeah which, 87 which, i think or yeah, 87 like, million which is uh -huh. but is is that including uh like you know renting from itunes or is that no that's just dollars at the theater okay so then there yeah. you go so so that's i guess somewhat of a a swing in, in the right direction there because yeah for sure uh i would not have uh i would not have expected that um, no that's that one got through somehow yeah and now do you think like the whoever kind of green let that like it, it, they're gonna uh probably try and go make more of those like is that like they're it's gonna be really on the nose of like well i i don't know if you can sequel that one in particular but it it probably you know makes it a little easier to do slightly crazy movies you know with a crazy premise right uh than than before i mean i, I you know elizabeth banks was associated with that she's super talented and i yeah, think carrie russell uh, was in that i believe yeah and i i think phil lord and chris miller produced it so you, you had a lot of people behind it to get it over the over the line yeah um now but I'm, I'm glad it got made when you were saying earlier that we need you know 
one's a fluke, two to three is is like a is does this count as one? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe there's one. That's one. So now we need two or three more. <laughs> All right. So then the machine and then I don't yeah. know what other, what other comedies are and coming then up. we'll do the one with the three million in in New York with uh with the, that with, we have to figure out Trevor Wallace. Well, we know yeah, Trevor, yeah, yeah. Trevor's been on our podcast, so we know him. Uh, Ryan Ryan's done some sketches with him, so we know Trevor. We can make that happen. Um, all right, all right. Th- thank you. We're gonna wrap this up. Thank you for coming on. Where can people uh, find you if if they want to uh, find you online? Oh, I'm just at uh, Twitter Roy Price. And you have a Substack as well that they can. Yeah, I mean it has a link tree, so you can see all the other things. All, all the other the, stuff. You know, yeah. The easy thing to remember is Twitter Roy Price. Right. Do you have any thoughts on what's going on with Twitter? Not really. I mean, it you know seems to work fine. No, but I mean, like in terms of, <laughs> <laughs> it's not that buggy. No, I think I mean in terms of like, um, you know how they have two hour. They've like now allowed you can upload up to two hours of video on Twitter. Uh, it, it seems like they're trying to bring podcasting on there. Tucker Carlson's show is going to be on there. Uh, now I don't know if anyone well, on the left is going to be. Doing I actually think but. Twitter is is going to be huge, and it's already huge, but I, I think it's going to be much huger, and it has a huge opportunity in front of it. So. Yeah. I mean, I wish I could buy stock in Twitter now, but I Me too. Cannot. I had stock in Twitter and then they did their deal. And he, he, Elon even said too that uh, at the time that he was going to try and let people keep a share of the private company. But then I guess he, I don't know if that was, if that was even a possibility to actually in practice do. Yeah. I'm, I'm bullish on Twitter. I, I think they have a really strong roadmap and, uh, and I think they're going to succeed. So yeah. It it is the only site where I don't feel like when I go off of it that I just wasted a bunch of time. Yeah, right. I think that's a good point. Like TikTok and Instagram, I get sucked into those things sometimes. Like I I haven't even like an app on my phone that like regulates my time on them, so that like it kicks. Oh really? Yeah, it's called oh, wow. un- Unpluck, P L U K, but or Q. But I it, like, like kicks YouTube. me off. Of- yeah, YouTube oh, okay. is yeah, YouTube is I think Twitter's trying to fold in some of the best parts of YouTube uh-huh. into Twitter to be kind of like a bit of a more of an everything right, stuff, I guess. But but yeah, but anyways, like Instagram, TikTok, when I get off of those, I was like, that was that was that was watching like whatever trash TV but just on my Well on internet. TikTok there's one guy, by the way, on, on TikTok, uh I think called Side Quests that is very funny that you might like. Uh, but basically on TikTok, I, I think I liked a couple things from Kingdom of Heaven, you know, the Ridley Scott movie. Yeah. And so ever since then, all it gives me is, is like trad calf, trad <laughs> Catholic, like yeah, yeah, hardcore yeah. medieval uh, stuff. And, Apparently um, you can reset your algorithm. I think you, okay. TikTok has like a <laughs> setting because sometimes I wish I could. Do, I had to make like a new Twitter account. Like I have basically like a hardcore because I f- fancy myself pretty middle of the road. But then I start I feel getting shown too much like stuff on the right. So then I have like a hardcore liberal Twitter account so that my, so that Twitter account only gets shown stuff on the left so that I can kind of like balance it out because they huh. need they need like modes like Lex Friedman said it but I thought this for a long time where like I need like a mode like I need like a church mom mode on Twitter where I can see what that they would see like I want to see all these people's different POVs on like on Twitter essentially so that That's I just, interesting. Just so I can have a different look at what people like what they're you know, view of the right. world is, you know, because otherwise right. you just get fed some of this, just like a loop. Another yeah. Thing. Well, I, I have the mute list, so I have a lot of topics muted. Yeah. Like there are many things I'm not interested in. Right. And so I, I find that very helpful. Yeah. Uh, uh, I've done for a instance little... with like Harry and Megan. Right. Like I had to hit that hard on the mute <laughs> list. 
it's every variation of the name, like Duke and Duchess of Sussex. And, and you, you know, have whatever. to do a, and every like four different spellings of Megan and like. Yeah, right. Like oh. in case someone misspells it, <laughs> you got to catch that. <laughs> but Man. now I've got it. I've got it filtered out cold. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if they'll be able to do a thing where you get just like, you know, um, basically use people's filters. You're like, hey, can I or something like that? Maybe. Right. I don't know. I, I agree, though. I think Twitter is uh, I'm very excited about Twitter. It's the only one that I think it's the only one I think is doing cool stuff. That's not literally just based around sucking you into the app and keeping you there for no good reason. Yeah. Like no, they're trying to actually do something beneficial. That's um, TikTok. All right, Roy. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been a really fun episode and I, I appreciate you coming on. Everybody go follow Roy over on Twitter. Roy Price TV on Twitter. That was correct. I think it's just Roy Price. Oh, just Roy Price. Uh, my mistake. Yeah. And uh, we will be starting the after show at 11 o'clock tonight. You can uh, sign up over on Patreon or, you know, the places you can sign up. All right. Good night, everybody. See you. And back tomorrow night with a new episode of The Bathhouse, 1030 p.m. See you soon. Good night. I'm raising my stock, not talking my feet in some Birkin. Number Johnny Five got a fucking short circuit. Bring the track to life when I speak phenomenal. When I hit, she feel that shit in her abdominals. These rappers make me laugh like comic view, they comic through. You know I got a ball out, I hit the track running just like Sonic do. They don't want to turn on my light switch. Yeah. They was trying to get me on my hype shit. Yeah. They don't want to turn on my light switch. Yeah. And they tried to down me up some KO type shit. Yeah. They don't want to turn on my light switch. Yeah. Now we pulling up fresh on some flight shit. Ha. They don't want to turn on my light switch. Yeah. They don't want to turn on my light switch. Yeah. They don't want to turn on my light switch. Yeah. They was trying to get me on my hype shit. Yeah. They don't want to turn on my light switch. Yeah. Then they tried to down me up some KO type shit. Yeah. They don't want to turn on my light switch. Yeah. I'm pulling up fresh on some flight